Okay, thank you for having us. Um, we will tag team this talk between Jan Chodas, project manager, and myself. Uh, this is a variant of a presentation we gave at uh, CAPS as well. Next slide, please. So we will speak to project overview, where we are in terms of launch readiness, the current status of the mission, progress on the flight system and instrument sides, uh, the gravity and radio science team has been announced and we'll touch on that. And then I'll take uh, a little bit of time to uh, discuss the implications of the continuation review that Kurt Niebuhr discussed yesterday with regard to the, uh, the wide angle camera and the mass spectrometer and their science roles. We'll also end with an instrument mapping to the decadal survey. Next slide, please. Uh, overall, our project uh, reports to the science mission director at NASA, of course, through the Planetary Science Division, um, and works with the uh, program office at Marshall, Category 1 mission, uh, Class A risk classification tailored. We're, we're planning on the order of 50 low altitude flybys of Europa between 25 and 2400 kilometers over a, a little more than three and a half years. There'll be opportunist, opportunistic opportunities at Callisto and Ganymede. There are 10 science investigations now, including gravity and radio science, to uh, get at the habitability of Europa through understanding its ocean, ice shell composition, geology, and uh, current and recent activity. Uh, let me ask Jan to speak to uh, launch readiness and status and flight system. Thanks, Bob. Good afternoon, everybody. So we're aiming to have our spacecraft uh, at launch ready in early 2024, and we're in the midst of baselining um, the 2024 launch readiness date. We do have uh, opportunities to launch on an SLS both in the summer and the fall of 2024, and we also have an ELV opportunity in the fall of 24. Uh, currently, we're working with the SLS team um, towards meeting our near-term deliverables that are required um, first of all, for our upcoming CDR in December, and also for um, proceeding towards the 2024 launch opportunities. We've also been working with NASA's Launch Services Program to uh, determine uh, and have concluded that there is a, a, a commercial uh, option available for us in the 2024 timeframe. The, the, uh, the challenge of a, a launch vehicle for Clipper um, is driving us um, to have to keep two uh, launch vehicles in play. We really need a decision by the end of this calendar year in order to continue to mature the spacecraft development. Um, I have a couple of photos later and you'll see that our flight hardware is well underway. And as I mentioned, uh, we, did, we do have our CDR coming up in December, and it was uh, originally planned to be earlier, but because of this launch vehicle uncertainty, we've delayed it until the end of the year. Next slide, please. We are currently in the midst of a rebaselining exercise, both cost and schedule for moving from a launch readiness date of 2023 to 2024. Uh, I heard Alan say that um, the New Horizons team has done a great job coping with COVID Unfortunately, the, the impacts from COVID-19 to the Clipper project have been substantial, and we are still um, understanding the total extent of the impact. Uh, JPL, Goddard, and Marshall had all been on mandatory telework, uh, meaning that there was no on-site presence permitted. We did get permission to ramp up on-site tasks in uh, June, early July timeframe. But that was under the condition that we follow safe at work practices, of course, because keeping our personnel safe and healthy is the, the top priority for us. And that's slowing our planned progress. Uh, APL uh, never went on a mandatory telework, but they were on elective telework where people were encouraged to not come on site. Um, and therefore their progress was considerably slowed as well uh, due to their safe at work practices. And at the various instrument delivery organizations, in addition to JPL and APL, um, those have either been slowed down or stopped uh, and restarted with Safe at Work Practices. We've also had many vendors um, slowed down and or stopped um, and or starting up again uh, in a slower than desired manner. 
when we looked at our 2024 schedule um, for system in integration and test, uh, we did take our COVID-19 impacts into account and, and delayed the start of our uh, assembly test and launch operations uh, in a way that still maintains our 2024 LRD. Um, but we are continuing to assess the COVID situation and uh, the schedule impact every month. Next slide. Here you can see some photos of our progress. Um, on the left, you see the high gain antenna reflector um, completing its work. That's the flight unit. Uh, in the middle, you see the Nader deck uh, machining uh, halfway in progress. And on the right, you see um, an older photograph of the upper propulsion module. Uh, since that time, uh, we've installed the heat rejection system tubing and the propulsion subsystem hardware is actually being installed on that unit uh, at Goddard Space Flight Center currently. Next slide. I'll turn it back over to you, Bob. Thank you. So I'll speak to the um, status of the instruments a little bit. Uh, the various instruments have been undergoing their critical design reviews. And as you see, most of them are checked off as green here. This will also remind you of the acronyms for our various instruments, UV, plasma, dust, uh, ice penetrating radar, thermal, infrared spectrometer, uh, visible camera, neutral mass, spectrometer. Uh, there are two uh, CDRs yet to go. That is the second half of the reason uh, ice penetrating radar CDR. It, it, they had the in-vault part and this will be the out-of-vault part, the antennas, and then the Europa Clipper magnetometer, both coming in October. Next slide, please. Uh, and analogous to what Jan showed, there's been really exciting progress on the hardware side of the instruments. You're looking at, on the left, the MISE calcium fluoride lens. It's a single crystal rounded top there and, and um, a rectangular cube below, uh, about 4.4 centimeters across. That thing's going to Europa. This is the flight model collector assembly for PIMS. That's a gold coating over palladium. On the right is a prototype of the magnetometer hardware. Next, please. The Europa ultraviolet uh, spectrograph, a flight model housing that holds the instrument itself. In the, on the left, on this, in the center is the engineering model uh, uh, dust analyzer, SUDA, in the dust chamber. On the right is the Ethemus flight model telescope housing. Next, please. The engineering model for the mass spectrometer is there on the left. In the center is the engineering model for uh, the narrow angle camera, part of the Europa imaging system on its gimbal engineering model. And on the right is the prototype for the wide angle camera. And next uh, is the um, uh, still from the cool video of the deployment of the reason HF antenna, and on the right, the um, VHF antenna uh, deployment system being tested. Next, please. Uh, as Kurt Niebuhr mentioned yesterday, we have a gravity and radio science team now announced. Uh, NASA selected nine people for that team, seven from the US, and two from Italy, including team leader Erwan Mazarico from Goddard. Because Europa Clipper co could not propose uh, for uh, co existing co of the mission approach, Kurt Niebuhr uh, and myself, uh, and are now considered part of the formal gravity and radio science team to make it in a baker's dozen. Next, please. So I'd like to speak a little bit on the role of the wide angle camera and then of mass specs as related to the continuation review. As Kurt Niebuhr discussed yesterday, uh, the Europa imaging system, ICE, and the mass spectrometer mass specs are now cost capped. And the wide angle camera and the mass spectrometer will or are in the process of being removed from the formal level ones we still expect 
uh, both instruments will fly and be highly capable, potentially as highly capable as they would have been. Um, but this is an important means of cost control uh, as um, decreed by uh, NASA in the continuation review process. So I just wanted to speak to the role of the wide angle camera just a little bit so you understand what it does. Uh, it integrates with the narrow angle camera to provide global imaging coverage and regional scale topographic data. Uh, and it provides coordinated context for the remote sensing data sets of the mission. The image on the right is meant to illustrate the field of view of the wide angle camera, that big uh, green rectangular box labeled WAC. And in the center there, you see the fields of view of the other remote sensing instruments and its uh, push broom. So all are traveling along the surface there. Um, and it's also context uh, in a way we'll talk about for the, for the um, ice penetrating radar. So the wide angle camera obtains uh, topography by push broom, three line push broom stereo. It obtains color and um, provides context for Europa UVS, MISE, narrow angle camera, and Ethemus as labeled there. Uh, when it comes to the ice penetrating radar, it adds, it aids, sorry, the um, radar in identifying false subsurface echoes by mapping the topography. It also provides a topographic data set that could be used for a potential future lander for terrain relative navigation. And of course, there's high public engagement uh, potential such as color flyovers of Europa's surface. By, um, so let's go to the next slide which dramatizes if we didn't have the um, wide angle camera, what the implications uh, would be for the remote sensing data sets. We'd be able to use narrow angle camera imaging, but uh, in a much spottier way as context. Uh, the next slide shows, and we'll, we'll do similar for mass specs, shows a, a wide angle camera centric view of our uh, nine level one requirements. So the nine level ones are all there as labeled uh, as to whether they can be categorized as ice and ocean composition, geology, uh, current activity. And the baseline are shown in the left column and the threshold in the right column. So um, NASA uh, uh, asks us to uh, remove dependence of the level ones on the wide angle camera and the it's hard, hard without pointing, but the pink box G2 under geology is the key one where the wide angle camera shows up in the level ones. And with a uh, unsettlingly easy uh, modification to the level ones uh, by reducing the aerial coverage of the topography to what the narrow angle camera alone could do that relieves the dependence of level ones on the wide angle camera. We made a parallel uh, adjustment for the threshold. Now there are other colors, colored boxes here, and especially the orange ones um, suffer a bit more, but can still pass uh, despite the wide angle camera coming uh, out of the level ones formally. We're keeping the lower level requirements there. We expect the instrument to fly, uh, but in addressing NASA's concerns, um, we've made the one edit to geology. And as far as the support for radar, the reason instrument, nice penetrating radar instrument, will be able to use interferometry to uh, understand, uh, to discriminate clutter, whether a reflection is coming from the subsurface or off to the sides. Uh, that's better done with topography from the wide angle camera, but it can be done from interferometry, from uh, reason. Again, we fully expect the wide angle camera will make it through and fly, in which case we'll do a great job because we'll have the wide angle camera and interferometry to help. But if the wide angle camera doesn't make it through, um, we can do the job uh, with reason alone if we had to. Uh, the other orange box is context for the highest resolution images. So we'll have spottier context imaging than we would have 
if we have the knack, uh, if we have the whack. Next, please. And then uh, to mass specs, the mass spectrometer. Mass specs offers the Europa Clipper's best chance to determine energy for life in Europa's ocean. Understanding energy for life is a, it's a critical ingredient for life that we want to understand in, uh, uh, in understanding our overall goal of um, understanding Europa's potential habitability. This habitability measurement uh, sorry, the, explicitly by measuring trace organics if there are plumes at Europa uh, and from the sputtered atmosphere, uh, especially if there's contact communication with an ocean, the ratios of organics can permit understanding of ocean uh, uh, energy for life. But this habitability measurement is not explicit in the level one requirements, has not been explicit in the level one requirement which mentions the composition and sources of volatiles, particulates, and plasma sufficient to identify the signatures of non-ice materials, especially organic compounds. There's also um, um, sufficient uh, science margin to identify organics, especially uh, if plumes exist by the existing uh, mass specs instrument. But that said, even neutral mass spectrometry of simple organics and volatiles and their isotopic content would be very powerful in characterizing Europa's atmosphere. And that was the original recommendation of the Europa science definition team. The mass spectrometer goes above and beyond that original concept in being able to get at potential habitability. The plot you're, sh you're seeing on the left um, maps out the potential of mass specs, what you, what you should look at is the boxes in the lower left show an example model of the compounds that, the mass, that mass specs can observe at Europa through its ambient mode, flybys of Europa in orange, and then using a cryotrap to, to trap uh, low abundance volatiles uh, in the blue and the green regions. So the orange region can check the box for what the science definition team uh, was after. But of course, we want to really get at habitability. And if there are plumes, the next slide shows that um, a, a, a great array of compounds could exist in a model plume uh, and detectable by mass specs, especially if it has its cryotrap. Uh, what NASA put in its decision memo is that the orange region, the performance will be the performance floor, the ambient, ambient region. That is uh, bec because mass specs is cost capped, as, as Kurt Niebuhr said, headquarters wanted to turn all the knobs possible. And one of those knobs is if we can't afford the cryo trap, then pull it out. Let's save cost and cost risk and an ambient flyby performance will be good enough and better than not having a mass spectrometer at all. So that's where we are. And, and the folks at Swery, Jim Birch, uh, now as acting PI, are working diligently uh, to do the best possible job on mass specs. Next, please. Uh, in removing mass specs from the level ones, this, this is now color coded from mass specs perspective. Uh, the composition C3 is the one that changed. So instead of requiring volatiles, particulates, and plasma, uh, oh, sorry, this is, yeah, this is it, sorry. Uh, uh, and getting at organ organic compounds there, it now adds in at least of one of, in at least one of the above forms volatiles, particulates, or plasma, we will be able to hunt organic compounds. The dust analyzer can check that box for particulates. So that pulls the requirement for mass specs out of the level ones, but assuming it flies and assuming it's capable, we'll be able to do uh, the same or nearly so uh, as good a job as originally envisioned. Uh, next, please, just to wrap up. Um, this chart shows the decadal survey prioritized objectives for Europa on the left uh, in, in the first column. 
and then check boxes, whether large or small, uh, primary or, or additional methods for achieving these various uh, objectives. So um, we, are, we continue to be a robust mission. Uh, we continue to expect that we will have the full payload complement, uh, but if we don't fully get there, we're still robustly achieving the decadal survey science.